What's up, y'all? How we doing? I guess you already just told me. Sorry. Hey, it's good to see you guys. Uh, I'm Ryan Proctor. If we haven't met, I would love to meet you. Come say hi afterwards or something like that. But glad to be here. So I want to start tonight with a question. Who here has an older brother or sister? Okay. This side of the room is all the younger brothers and sisters. This is all the oldest, right? Or only children. No. Uh, so, so here's the question, right? What, if you don't have an older brother, if you, you guys, you know, just pretend you have an older brother or sister. But what would it take for you to believe that your older brother or sister was the son or daughter of God? And in fact, God himself. What would it take? Like, would that be kind of hard to believe? Like, think about the fights that you've had. Think about the selfishness that he or she has shown. Think about the bullying and the, you know, all the, whatever. Whatever you went through. Like, what would it take for you to believe that he or she, he or she was a son or daughter of God? So I've got an older brother, and, uh, and it would take a lot. Like, it would take a lot for me to believe that. So, like, for example, when I was around 12 or 13 or 14 or something, probably too old for this story to be cool, but I got, I, I was real sentimental and I got this gift for Christmas or, or my birthday. Someone gave me a box of Junior Mints and I was like, dude, Junior Mints are the best candy. I am going to save these and I'm going to eat them at like the perfect opportune moment. Like it's going to be the perfect situation. And so I set them like in the place of honor on a shelf in my room and they proceeded to sit there for five months or so. And eventually, my older brother, Brett, he comes in my room and he's like, dude, if you don't eat those junior mints, I'm going to eat them. And I was like, you better not. Those are mine. I can make them sit as long as I want to. I will eat them when I want to and where I want to and how I want to. You have no right over those junior mints. And he's like, all right, whatever. And within less than a week, I come home from school one day and I'm changing. And I, and I look at the place of honor on my shelf and the junior mints are gone. And I'm like, where'd the junior mints go? How long have those been gone? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Did I miss it a couple days ago? And I'm like, I better go check with Brett. And so I go in the other room and there's Brett sitting there watching TV with my empty box of junior mints next to him. I was ready to kill him. Like, oh my gosh. And in all seriousness, <laughs> this is one of the biggest fights we ever had. Like, I was so mad. And so, so like, it would take a lot for me to believe that my older brother was the son of God. And in fact, God himself, even a couple years ago, fast forward and my younger brother, Jason and I were co-best men at his wedding and we got to give the best man speech. And it was literally titled, Things Brett Taught Me Not To Do, right? So like, it would take a lot. And I bring that up because as Myron said, we are gonna spend the next five weeks going through a book of the Bible uh, called James, written by a guy named James, who was the younger brother, half-brother technically, of Jesus. He was raised with Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. Jesus was his big brother. Like you can imagine that they probably fought a little and argued a little. And like, okay, Jesus was without sin, so it might have been a little bit different than our growing up experience with our brothers and sisters. But still, like, it would be hard to believe that he was God. And yet, James, like it's evident that James came to believe even that his older brother was in fact the savior of Israel that had been prophesied for centuries. He was the son of God and in fact, God himself in the flesh. James came to believe that and he came to call Jesus his Lord and his savior, his own brother. And honestly, I think this is maybe one of the most convincing things that Jesus truly was who he said he was, that even his younger brother chose to believe. And so we're going we're gonna to walk through James for the next five weeks, and we're just going to go chapter by chapter and see what James has to say to us. So James was, he was a, not only was he the brother of Jesus, but he became a leader in the Christian church in Jerusalem. And this book, so where it's located, it's in the New Testament, which is the second we always say half, but it's really the second section of your Bible because it's like the Old Testament's like two thirds of your Bible. But Old Testament is everything that was before Jesus. And then New Testament is during Jesus' life and afterwards. And so um, James, the book of James is found in the New Testament after Jesus' death and resurrection. And he wrote, it's actually a letter. And so this is, it's a letter written by James to 
new-ish Christians scattered throughout the Roman Empire. So this letter was intended to be distributed in multiple geographic locations around the Mediterranean Sea. Um, James wrote it around the year 40 AD. And so uh, when you, just to give us a little bit of context on wh why do I tell you that? Um, Jesus, you know, we base our calendars off of Jesus's life, right? Like he was born around the year zero, uh, the, around the year zero. And he lived about 32, 33 years. So his death and resurrection was in the year 32, 33 AD. So this book being written in the early 40s means James wrote this letter 10 to 15 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he wrote it, his purpose in sending this out to new Christians around the Roman Empire was to give them instructions on how to live out their faith. And that's why I think James is such a great book for us to study because as young adults, we're like, yeah, yeah, I'm following Jesus, but somebody like, just tell me what to do. Like, I want to know, just give me something. Like, don't just like, just give me something to do. And James tells us what to do. He gives us instructions on how to live out our faith. And so that was why I think James is going to be a really, really awesome book for us to study tonight. And so we're going to go through James chapter one. But before we jump in there, what, one thing I've got to like make sure we're all on the same page here, because this is a book that, like I said, it's written to Christians to help them understand how to live out their faith. And so we've got people in this room who probably have been Christians for a long time. We got people who have been maybe Christians for a very short time. We maybe got people who aren't Christians, don't follow Christ. And so I want to make sure that we all understand, like, first of all, in order for us to understand why, G why, where James is coming from, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? And essentially is this, it's the, the gospel, it's believing in the gospel, which says that your, your sin is, your, sorry, you cannot do enough good to outweigh your sin, and yet you cannot out -sin the crucifixion. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, the condition of human beings, as we're taught by the Bible, is that when we commit a sin, even just one sin, which is anything that goes against God's design and intent for our lives, when we commit even just one sin, one little lie, one little gossip, it's enough to condemn us to eternity in hell, eternal death in hell. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. So when we sin, we earn eternal death. And, and we can't do enough good to earn our way out of that. Even once in, we cannot do enough good to earn our way out of that. And the great news is that God saw the condition of his creation, mankind, and he saw that we could not save ourselves. And so he decided, I'm going to save them. And so God came to the earth in the form of a human being with flesh and blood, his son, Jesus. And he lived a perfect life where he committed no sin and therefore earned no death so that when he died he and then he and then he did he died so that he could pay a debt that he never owed so that or he or he sorry he took the punishment that he never deserved to pay a debt we would never be able to repay he was convicted of or he was accused of a crime he was given the death penalty he was crucified on a cross and 3 days later he rose from the dead proving one, that he was who he said he was. He was God. And two, showing that he had conquered death. He had experienced separation from God and he had, because of his sacrifice, because he had not earned it, he had conquered death and he had, and, and through that, earned salvation for all of us who had earned that, who had deserved that. He earned our salvation through his death on the cross. And what that means, it, he offers it freely, freely to us if we just believe in him, surrender our lives and place our trust in him. And that means that we can actually be 100% sure that when we die, we will spend eternity with our creator, God, in heaven, simply because we believe and we trust in him. And it's not because of anything we do. It's not because we're a good person. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross. He paid our way into heaven. And because of that, it is guaranteed. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what we believe in. That's what we place our lives in. That's what we place our hopes in. And so it's important to understand that in order to, in order for James's teaching to make sense. And so I'm going to read through James chapter one. And listen, I'm not going to be able to teach you guys something about every single verse in this chapter. There's a lot here, but I'm going to pick out some things that stood out to me that I think are applicable to our lives. And, and we'll learn from that. And 
Um, you know, we'll have some conversations afterward. If something else stood out to you, you have questions, whatever, but we're going to walk through it. And so James chapter one, verse one, it's going to be on the screens. You guys can follow along with me as I read. Um, it starts out like this. He introduces himself, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so right here, he's telling us what I already said is that Jesus is Lord of his life. He believes that his older brother was God and that he is the Lord over his life, and he worships him as God. That's what James is telling us. And he, so he goes on. To the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. He's referring to these new Christians who had converted from Judaism, and they're scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And so he just says, greetings, right? He does not waste any time on like some fancy hello. He's just like, greetings. And then James gets right into his content. He comes in with a wrecking ball. And this, the rest of this chapter from this point on is kind of split into two main topics. And the first topic is trials and temptations. So we'll spend a little bit of time here and then we'll keep reading. But he comes in with a wrecking ball to begin with. And he, he starts off pedal to the metal and he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So this is counterintuitive, countercultural, really, really wild to us because like literally it's our natural reaction to trials and things that are bad that happen to us would be to feel sorry for ourselves, to take a victim mentality, to uh, be mad at God and be like, what the heck, you know? And he's saying, no, like, I want you to go exact opposite of that and consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds. And he's going to spend the rest of this chapter, chapter fleshing out this idea. He says, he goes on in verse five and he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, that's the wisdom to consider it joy in trials. So if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. And so, he, and he's going to continue fleshing out this idea by talking about a rich man and a poor man and, and how they can consider it joy. So he says the brother in humble circumstances or the, the poor brother ought to take pride in his high position. What? But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. Again, that is opposite of what we would think. That was opposite of what culture would tell us. Because he, he ought to take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. And so he's, he's talking about like, you know, consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds. And he's pointing out that the man who is poor, who doesn't have much, is going through trials all the time. And his faith is being grown through that. So he should take pride in his high position, right? But the man who is rich may not be facing those trials and he may not be growing through that. And all his wealth will end up fading away and he will be left empty if that's where he finds his identity and his and his pride, and his joy in life. And he brings, he brings it back together. So those, those examples seem a little bit off the wall, but he brings it back and says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And so I want to pause right here, and I want to explore this idea of considering it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds. And what Jesus is saying here is, he, just, he says that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And so he's saying your, your faith is like a muscle and, and the testing is like a workout. Because when you go and you work out your muscles, what's actually happening, the way that you get muscle growth is you're creating micro tears in your muscle fibers and blood goes and it fills in those little tears, those little gaps with nutrients that your muscles can grow more muscle. And that's, that's how muscle growth Happens. So when you put your muscles through a workout, through a trial, through testing, they 
They are torn apart a little bit and those gaps are filled in and they grow. And in the same way, when your faith is put through trials, when you are going through trials and your faith is tested, you create micro tears in your faith. And as you lean into God, the Holy Spirit comes and fills in those gaps and it grows your faith just like a muscle in a workout. And that's, that's the image that, or that's essentially what he's telling us here. And he, he walks us through the process. He's like, hey, the testing of your faith is going to grow your faith. And, it, and that growth of your faith is going to develop perseverance so that you're going to be able to stick through more and more. You're going to be able to stick by God's side through it. And then he says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's wild. So perseverance is developed so that it can make us mature and complete. It, it, mature and complete and, and growing to be like God. And so I want to explore this. Like, what does it look like to have joy in trials? Because, you know, certainly it does not look like being happy all the time. And I think one place where Christians have, have kind of messed this up is like, faking it, right? Like faking joy, faking happy whenever there's a trial going on and being like, no, no, like praise the Lord, even though like I am dying inside, I'm coming apart through what's going on, but I'm going to fake it. And that's not what he's calling us to do. And he's certainly not calling us to celebrate whenever trials happen. It's not like, yay, you know, someone I love got sick. This is a great time for me to grow. Like, I don't think he's calling us to celebrate, but I think we got to understand what this idea of joy is. And it comes back to the gospel. It comes back to that core belief of Christianity is that I can be 100% sure of where I'm going to end up at the end of my life. And it's not because of anything I've done, but it's because of what Jesus did on the cross and that he has paid for it for me. And that I've received that free gift of forgiveness. And so I can have joy knowing that I'm assured, guaranteed a spot in eternity where I belong with my creator. And that, and like, that is where joy is found. That is what we hope in. Our hope and our joy is found in something that is an eternity, that is an after this life. And what that means is because our joy is not found in things in this life, nothing that can happen to you can steal your joy away. That's what joy, that's what it means to remain joyful because our joy is found and it's kept in the eternal promise of God. That's what it means to have joy. And so we can actually rejoice through trials and, and we can even look and we can look into our past. And those of you who have been following Christ, you may be able to look into your past and see the trials that you've been through and seeing how God has grown your faith through that trial. And you can, you can maybe look back and thank him for growing your faith through that trial and making you more like him. And that's, that's the other thing is that as we're made mature and complete, we are becoming more like him, which is the goal of this life. But we maintain that joy in understanding where our eternity lies and it cannot be taken away from us. And you know, when we go through trials, when we go through testing, one common thing is that we're going to be tempted to question whether God is really good, whether God is really for us. And that's going to lead us to be tempted to seek out our joy, our fulfillment, our purpose in other things. It's going to seek, lead us to seek to cope through other things and like maybe, you know, maybe to seek out joy or coping through an addiction like masturbation or pornography or substance abuse or self-harm, or it's going to tell us like, well, I'm not going to get what, I'm, what I want in this life, so I'm going to pursue money so I can, because clearly God's not going to give it to me. And so we're led to, we're often, when we go through a trial, we're going to be led to temptation. And so where James goes next is that he's going to explain this idea of temptation. So we'll pick up in verse 13. And James says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, <clears throat> he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And so James takes the time to give us this explanation of what temptation is. And, and 
one of the important things that we want to pull out of this is that temptation is not from God. Like, God does not tempt us. Temptation means that we are drawn to sin, and God does not do evil. He's not tempted by evil. He doesn't want us to do evil, so God is never tempting us. So we should not assume that when we're facing temptation that God is tempting us. However, it's very clear through the Bible that he does allow the enemy, Satan, to tempt us, but he promises that it will never be more than we can bear and that he will provide a way out. And so understanding temptation and the difference between temptation and sin, I have this, I have this little cartoon that I think gives a great picture of it. <clears throat> so so in this, in this depiction, we're the donkey, right? Sorry. And, and, and the enemy, Satan, is the, is the man sitting on his back. And like, okay, a donkey loves a carrot, right? Like, or a horse loves a carrot, whatever. So he's, he's dangling this carrot out in front of the donkey. And through that, like, if, if he follows what he wants, if he follows that temptation, the enemy, Satan, can lead him wherever he wants him to go. And just like the donkey loves a carrot, like, let's be honest with ourselves, a lot of times we love sin. Like, sin is really fun until it turns out not so fun. But in the beginning, we love sin and we're drawn to it. And so he's just dangling this temptation, this, this carrot of sin in front of us. Whatever it is, there's all kinds of different things that the enemy tempts us with. And he's dangling it in front of us, trying to get our attention, trying to get us to go after it. And the important difference here is that, that the, the presence of that carrot dangling out in front of us, that's temptation and that's not sin, but it turns to sin, as, as James explains, it turns to sin whenever we take that temptation and we turn it into action. And for us, in the reality, what Jesus explains is that that even happens in our mind. When we, when we look at that carrot and we fixate on it and we start to obsess over it and we're like, man, I just wish I could have that. Like we have even gone to sin at that point, even before we've actually started pursuing after it and running after that thing that'll never quite be within our grasp, that'll never quite fulfill us. And it's so important to understand this difference because especially when we're faced with sexual temptation, right? Like you, you are going to see sexually tempting images when you're driving around town on billboards throughout Wheeling, right? You're going to see it on social media. You're going to see it on TV. It's not sin whenever the enemy puts a temptation in front of you. But it becomes sin whenever you allow your mind to just dive into that and to attach to that or when you take it into action, right? And, and I think that's so important, especially with sexual sin, because it's something that's put in front of us to understand the difference. We're not making excuses and saying like, oh, I didn't really sin when we did. But we want to understand that sometimes there's temptation that's put in front of us. And, and that's not our fault. That's not sin. But we are called to Basically, bounce your eyes. Don't fixate on it. Don't focus on it. Don't let it take over you. But sin, whenever it turns into action, whenever it's, it's full grown, it becomes sin and sin, or, uh, temptation becomes sin. Sin gives birth to death. And so James gives us this cool illustration and helps us to understand what temptation really is. And then he wraps up chapter one, uh, verse 16. He says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word, through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. And so with this, he wraps up this first topic, this idea of trials and temptations and what it looks like to live through that. And so then we're going to go into the second topic of this chapter. And it's the idea of being hearers, versus being doers of God's word. And it, it, I mean, listening versus doing. And so <clears throat> he starts by saying, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And here's the, here's the pivotal passage I want to focus on. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, 
He will be blessed in what he does. And he wraps up the chapter. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And so I want to look into this idea of being hearers versus being doers. And so, you know, he, he says, hey, like, don't just hear the word of God. And when he's talking about the word of God, it's, it's the instructions of Jesus on how to live our lives, the commands of Jesus on how to live our lives. Don't just hear it, but actually put it into action. And so I think this is really well illustrated. Like, I don't know if you guys are like me, but a lot of times I don't know where I'm going around this town. And so I need to put an address into Google Maps and be led there, right? And so I'm, I'm like, okay, I know where I want to end up. And I'm going to, I'm going to put that into this, into Google Maps. And, and Google, you know better than I know how to get there. So I'm going to follow your directions, right? But then if I'm driving down the road and, and it's like, okay, Google's like, all right, you're going to turn right. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to turn right. I'm just going to go straight. Like, I'm going to keep going straight. I think, I think I've got this. And then it's like, okay, that was wrong. Rerouting, rerouting. Okay, up here we can go left and we'll fix it. And I'm like, no, I don't think I'm going to go left. I'm going to go right. That's like, I'm going to do that. And when I don't follow the instructions on the map on going to the place that I decided I wanted to go, I might end up not getting there. I run out of gas, end up in a bad part of town. Like, it's not going to go the way that I wanted it to go. I'm certainly not going to end up where I wanted to end up. And I think in the same way, like when we, when we look into the Word of God, when we look into Jesus' teachings for our lives in, in the Bible through people like James, and we just hear it, but we're like, oh, I'm just going to go, like I know it says turn right, but I'm just going to go this way, right? We, we say, hey, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. That's the direction. I know where I want to end up. You know better than I do on how to get there, so I'm going to follow after you. But then when we actually get the instructions, we choose to go our own way. That's what it is to be just a hearer of the word and not a doer. But James is calling us. He's like, no, no, no. Like, don't just hear what it says. Like, even when it goes against something that you believed or something that you like, like, do what it says. Jesus knows you better than you know you. He knows what's best for your life. And he's going to guide and direct your steps through his commands and his instructions. So actually put into practice what you're hearing in this word. And he uses this imagery of a mirror. And he tells us that it's like, it's like, hey, you, if you look into this word, you look into Jesus' instructions, his, his guidance for your life, and you choose not to do it just because you don't like it. It's like, oh man, like I know Jesus says to not, not have sex until you're married, but I just really like sleeping with my boyfriend or with my girlfriend. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to like honor Jesus with everything else in our life. Or, or, or he says, hey, you know, don't, don't get drunk on wine. Be sober-minded. Like, but I'm, you know what? Like, I really have fun whenever I get drunk with my friends and we don't do anything that bad. So it's, it's fine. Like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to kind of pass that one up, but I'm just going to follow Jesus. And he's like, that's like looking in a mirror and seeing that your face, there's dirt on your face. There's food stuck in your teeth. Your hair is disheveled. You're, you know, for, if you're me, you're like, um, oh, I need to shave my neck. My neck beard's growing out. Well, like, you're, you look in the mirror and you see your appearance that there's something wrong and you say, you're like, eh, whatever. And you go away and you just, you don't even do anything about it. You don't fix it. You don't clean it up. You forget what you looked like. And he's saying, that's what it's like whenever we just hear the word and we don't put it into practice and we don't do what it says. And he's calling us, no, like actually do what it says. Actually Put this stuff into practice. He knows you better than you know you, and he knows what you need and what's best for your life better than you. And so that's it, guys. That's, that's James 1. We, we wrap it up there. Um, and if, band, if you guys want to work your way back up here, um, you know, we, we talked about, there's, there's so much in this chapter, and I don't know if something stuck out to you, but like I said, Let's have a conversation. Let's, let's talk through it. Let's ask some questions or gather a group and just sit around and talk through it if you want. But, but, but what we looked at tonight, and, and, and I think the most important idea, at least to me, is this idea of having joy in trials. 
And I want you to take that with you tonight. And even if you don't memorize James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, memorize that idea and walk through life with it. And, and because we're all going to go through many trials, like little trials. You're going to fail a test. You're going to get in an argument with your friend. Someone's going to hurt your feelings. You're going to, you know, your boss is going to yell at you or something like that. And, 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 and can you walk through those with faith? Can you walk through those with joy, leaning into God and experience what it looks like to have faith in trials? So I encourage you, memorize that, walk through your life with that, and start to see and let that play out in your lives. And the second thing that we pulled out of this text is the idea of temptation and recognizing what temptation is, understanding that temptation is different from sin, but that if we dwell and we lean into temptation, if we attach to temptation, if we follow temptation, one, we're being led down the path that the enemy, Satan, wants us to follow and not the one that God is leading us down. And let's remember that God never tempts us. He never tempts us into evil. And the third idea that we pulled out is this idea of being doers, not just hearers of the word. And essentially we're saying like, hey, trusting that God knows better for your life than you do. And that, that when you let him, when you read his word, when you hear his commands and let them enter into your heart and transform you from the inside out, he's going to lead you into a life of purpose, into the life that you were called to live. And remembering all through it that our joy is ultimately found in eternity. And that that is because Jesus loved us when we were at the depth of our sin. He saw us when our mirror image looking into that was filthy, covered in cuts and bruises and scrapes and mud, and we couldn't clean ourselves off. And he said, you don't have to clean yourself off to come to me. You can come to me and I'll clean you off. And so that, so he heals our wounds and he, and he makes us clean. He makes us whole again. And that's why we want to take his teachings and, and we trust that he knows better. We want to put it into our lives and we want to actually do what he says. Let me pray and then we're going to wrap up with some, some worship songs. Lord, we just, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for James. Jesus, I thank you for being so convincing, for, for making it so evident of who you are that even your brother believed that you are God and that he, and that he chose to lead us in the same direction. I pray that we would hear James's words tonight, that we would put them into practice, Lord. I pray that you would lead us to, to consider it joy whenever we face trials of many kinds, that we would trust that, that you will bring through the testing of our faith, you will use that to grow our perseverance, to make us mature and complete, God. I pray that you would help us to trust you in that, that you would, that you would help us to lean into you and let you fill in those gaps with the Spirit and with your truth and with more faith that we might grow in you. Lord, help us to recognize temptation when it's hanging right in front of us and to not be phased by it, to not chase down the path that the devil wants us to go down, Lord. And again, help us to be doers of this word. Lord, I pray if this is anyone's first time to hear the gospel, to understand that we can have an assurance of, of eternity with you, I pray that that you would just speak that into their hearts tonight and that, that you would attract us to the truth of your gospel to surrender to you. Jesus, we worship you, we praise you, we thank you for the way that you work in our lives through the ups and the downs. And in your name we pray, amen.